jobs. I'm head of tech support for Imaging Spectrum, but also have I've also been a wedding photographer for 33 years and about five and a half years ago. My wife said, hey, there's something going on with this photo booth industry. We already had the printers, we were already doing event photography, already had a Shinko 2145, had the computers, had the cameras, had the lights, had everything except software and a booth and uh, um, the touch screen. And so we kind of put together you know, our, our photo booth, started adding it to our wedding packages, it's been very successful, been really happy with it. Um, I do have a Bachelor of Arts in Photography, I've been doing photography for a really long time, and I, I love the art of photography, I love the science of photography, and I love taking photos. The slideshow that was going on before, those were all my photos. I love doing pin up and steampunk and weddings and things like that, so just kind of give you an idea. Some of the photography I've done, not necessarily photo booths or events. Um, so the first, the first thing I want everyone to realize, and this is kind of, a, this is kind of known in the industry, First rule of tech support, read the manual. Okay. <laughs> Don't forget, you've got manuals, hopefully with everything. Um, again, in the industry, that's kind of, a, kind of a running joke. Read your manual. So when you get something new, especially a camera, now half the, probably three quarters of the manual will not apply to you, but at least understand you know, where your settings are, where your controls are, and things like that. So very important to, uh, to remember. Uh, check my timer here. I got plenty of time. Okay. So, first thing I want to go over is parts of a camera. Now, this is most of this is relating to a DSLR camera. Um, point shoots, uh, webcams don't really co co coincide with the DSLR. But all of them have bodies and lenses. Uh, but as far as having ISO controls, shutter speeds, f stop, white balance, exposure modes, autofocus, and manual focus. This is unique to DSLRs, you know, over any other type of camera system. So, the first one I'm going to talk about real quick is, is body and lenses. Most of you that have like a Rebel or a camera like that came with a kit lens, an 18 to 55 lens. Great for photos, plenty for what you need to do, super wide enough, super telephoto enough. So, it's, it's, it's going to be fine. It doesn't have, you know, as sharp of an image as you would from a $2,000 Canon L series or something, but it's still going to be fine for what you're doing. Most of the, well, all the Rebels and most cameras that most people use have what's known as a DX crop factor. Your sensor is actually smaller than what it could be in the camera. And I've got a sample photo here. Um, when, you look at the, when you look at the red line, that's what a full frame camera would be shooting. The blue frame in the middle is a DX, or the smaller sensor, crop sensor. That's why your 18 millimeter lens is really a 27 millimeter lens. That's why it's much, much longer than you think it is. So you always have to kind of bear that in mind if you have a DX camera. Not a big deal for what, what we're doing for the majority of time, just something to bear in mind. Um, I'll have to go back to slide, there we go. Um, zoom versus prime. What a prime lens means is that it's one focal length. It's not 18 to 55, it's 20, it's 28, it's 35. It's some sort of fixed focal length. And the difference between those kind of lenses is they're much sharper than a zoom lens. Something has to give when they engineer a zoom lens. Again, not a big deal for the photo booth industry. Just FYI, when someone says prime or, I'm sorry, prime or zoom, what they're referring to. Um, fixed f-stop on a zoom lens, like a like the kit lens that you buy. The kit lens will usually have like, let's say like 3.5 f-stop and 4.5. That's because it changes as you zoom. More expensive zoom lenses, like you know, $1,000, $2,000 zoom lenses have a fixed um, focal length between them. That's only important if you try, if you want to do f-4, but yet you're zoomed out and it's f-5.6. Now that's probably a little technical, but hopefully we'll make that clearer later. Um, invest in glass, keep buying, kind of in the industry. For photographers, that's kind of what we talk about. You know, like a good lens will last 20 years, where your camera body might last 30. So just kind of put that into perspective when you're, if you want to buy really expensive lenses. We already talked about this. Okay, exposure. There are 
three things that control exposures on camera. One is the ISO, one is the shutter speed, and one is the f-stop. And that's important because how do you set your exposure on your camera? We'll go over a little bit more details later about each one of those. And if you talk to a, if you call tech support or something and it says, or if someone looks at your photo and says, oh, it's about a stop to dark. What a stop of exposure means is it's either half or double what you're using currently. So F16 would become F11 for one stop to make it lighter. Um, oh, that should be F22, that should be the other um, But anyway, uh, to make it darker. So anyway, just, uh, just, just to let you know the difference between a stop and exposure. Most lenses now, and most cameras, have percent have quarter stops, you know, F, F13, F14, you know, F18. The shutter speed to be in between, instead of going from 250 to 500, they'll say 320 or something. So, and that's okay, because that's all an electronic thing. Old mechanical cameras didn't have those options. So, anyways, that, those are kind of the basics of exposure. Um, the top one's a big one. I get a lot of calls saying, my, um, my camera looks too dark, my photos look too dark. Don't judge your exposure by chimping. What chimping means, and again, that's an industry term, when you take a photo with your camera, and you look at your camera and you go, oh, 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 oh. So, seriously, that is what it's called, it's called chimping. So, um, so, but don't judge your exposure by chimping or looking at your monitor. Print out a photo, because that's what really matters. It matters that what you're giving your customer looks good. So again, don't just judge it by your camera or your monitor to a print. Um, this is, again, kind of a technical part of the term. A computer monitor is projected light or added to the color. And then remember that your monitor is bright. It's, it's lit from the back. It's got you know, colors, little, little pixel colors in the back that light up in dark, depending on what, you know, what, the, uh, what, the, what, you, what you have on your screen. Reflective color, your prints are reflective color, so they're completely different. So again, don't judge your exposure by looking at your print saying there's something wrong with the printer. It's possibly not your printer. You need to change your exposure. Again, we'll kind of go over later whether it's a shutter speed, whether it's f-stop, whether it's your flash, other things that can change your exposure. Um, calibrate your monitor. How to buy a something to calibrate your monitor, a couple hundred dollars. There's a company called Spider, a with monkey, color monkey. So if you really, really want to, you want to get a good color, buy one of those. But it's not really that important. You don't really need it for your output that you're doing uh, in your booth. Can, can y'all still hear me okay in the back? Okay, I'm gonna grab some water real quick. It's a little more humid in Dallas, where I'm from, so. Um, okay, so I talked about ISO earlier, and what, what the acronym means is International Standards Organization. Not important what it means, but just FYI. Film speed, or the ISO, is the sensitivity of what used to be film, but it's now the sensor. So, it's, and it's adjustable on digital cameras. However, the higher you go, on your ISO to get your, your photos to look good, the more noise or grain you've ever looked at. If you've ever looked at a photo that was shot at a really high ISO, it looks kind of, I mean, we used to call it grain in film, it just kind of looks like little dots. Um, so if possible, shoot under like 800 or 1,000, the lower the better. So again, it's all about quality. Um, and of course, if you have a, you're using flash or daylight, if you're outdoors shooting a booth or something, you really don't want to go 800, you're really hard to expose. Um, and try to avoid auto ISO. The reason auto ISO can be bad, I'm sure I'm feed, feed, feedback, auto ISO, especially bad if you're doing green screen or chrome photos, because what your camera can do is every time you take a photo, it'll give you a different ISO, so every one of your photos will look different. So just FYI, if you're doing auto ISO and your photos are all different, that's why. Set it for a number and go accordingly. So just FYI on the ISO. 
Okay, the shutter speed is how long the shutter is open, how long the light comes in through the lens and goes onto the, onto the sensor. Um, and always remember, shutter speeds are always a fraction of a second. So if someone says, I'm shooting at 125th, really what they need is 1 125th of a second. It's actually a fraction. Um, so obviously, if you're shooting at 8 seconds, that's different. But any of those fractions, 125th, 250, 60, 30, those are actually a fraction of 30th of a second, 60th of a second. And I know that I, I already saw this today. Someone called me over for a, for a tech question one of our customers over here. And his, his, um, his photos were blurry. And in looking at his, um, his shutter speed, it was set for bulk. Have any of you ever seen a bulb setting on your on your camera. Anyone know what I'm talking about? It when you do a when you do live view on your camera, it's really switching your camera to bulb. It's actually open. What bulb means? If you if you have ever seen a photo of a photographer from the 1800s, you know he had a little ball in his hand and he would squeeze. Well, that was called a bulb. And when he would squeeze that, it would open the shutter and it would leave the shutter open until it released it. That's what bulb means. The, the term is still on cameras. What it means is the shutter stays open until it's told to let go. So if you ever see that bulb setting, you know, on your camera or your photos look blurry, and you look on your look at you know on your camera or on your software and you see it says bulb, it, your live view has forgotten to switch it back to your shutter speed after it, it went out of that. Why it does it, I don't know. It's something that's in the driver from the manufacturers. And not knocking cannons, but it doesn't happen with cannons more often than Nikon. So again, if you do see that, it, is a, it, is, it just won't switch out of the bowl. Um, and when it says your life is bowl. So any questions so far? Is everyone awake? Okay. I know it's kind of a boring topic, but uh, all right, shutter speed number two. Um, Slow shutter speed under one that's one sixty of a second can cause blurry photos. For those of you using constant lights, LEDs, fluorescence, whatever's in the room, tungsten, you know, just regular bulbs, um, and you're wondering why your photos, you know, people aren't holding still, it's because the slower the shutter goes, the more it's possible for people to move in the photo. That's why higher shutter speeds are better, 125th, you know, 160, 200, 250, if you have enough light to make that happen. You kind of have to judge between do I want more f-stop, do I want faster shutter, do I want higher, so, higher ISO and get, get more grain. So again, it's all a, a give and take there. Um, the sync speed, um, also known as F, uh, X, some cameras have an X on it, is usually 200 to 250 per second. I'm going to give kind of a visual demonstration of what that means. On a, on a, on a shutter, the way shutters work is the shutter opens and then closes. Okay? So what happens with your shutter speed, if you take it, if you have it set at say 500 per second, what it does is it opens and it starts to close as it's going up. So if you've ever seen a photo that has a black bar across it, that's probably because your shutter speed is set at two. Uh, um, most cameras will tell you what your shutter speed is. If you're not sure, use 200 or 160 or 125. You'll know it's going to be okay. So, again, that's what sync speed means. Okay? And of course, the higher shutter speed makes the photo lighter, uh, uh, or the slower makes the photo darker because it's allowing more light on the sensor. So, again, kind of bear that in mind when you're setting your exposures. F-stop, the, the top list up there um, is actual F-stops that used to be on lenses and now again with digital and electronic uh, diaphragms, it's, it's different. They, they can be any number of between there. Those are kind of the traditional F-stops. Um, and it controls how much light comes through the lens. Remember, the shutter's how long, this one's how, how, uh, how, uh, how much light. I have a, a slide here. This is this is you know what the and then that's known as an aperture or diaphragm or f stop. Kind of has different terms for it. That opening is how much light is 
coming in. You haven't opened up all the way, it's letting a ton of light in. When you haven't stopped down, it's letting less light in. So again, always kind of bear that in mind. Um, go back here. Okay, so um, higher F number, like F22, means a smaller opening, but it means more depth of field, more space, and how much is in focus on your photo. Um, a smaller F slot, like F4, to let in more light, but it decreases the depth of field. You get much more narrow depth of field. So if you have three or four rows of people in your booth, and one row's in focus and the other one's out of focus, that's because you don't have enough, your F stop's not high enough, it's not getting enough, enough uh, depth of field. Um, just kind of FYI, this, if you ask the Campbell Wins company, they'll usually tell you that the sharpest F stop is somewhere in the middle, F8, F11, F16, somewhere around there. Just kind of useless trivia. They win you a million dollars someday on a millionaire, I doubt it. Um, but I was talking about depth of field. Three things control depth of field. Your focal length of your lens. The, the longer, the wider your lens is, 18, 20, 24, 22, 35, the more depth of field you have. That's good for your booth. You know, if you get that, if you have a small and closed booth and you have a wide lens, it should help your depth of field. Um, your f-stop, like I was talking about earlier, the higher the f-stop, the more depth of field. Lower, less depth of field. Camera to subject distance. The closer you are to your subject, the narrower the depth of field. The further away you are, the more. So again, there's a lot of factors there. If you have an open booth, pretty easy. In closed booth, starts limiting how much how much depth of field you can get. Excuse me. Um, first one says depth of field, one third in front, two thirds in the back. I wasn't sure how to describe this when I wrote this. <laughs> but let's say you've got let's say you have your cameras over here, you're shooting this way. You've got a row of people here, a row of people here, and a row of people in your photo booth. If you'll, and, and let's say you're manually focusing, or you're having trouble focusing, or you set your focus in your camera, if you'll always focus on the middle row, one third in front and two thirds in back will be in focus. Does that make sense? So again, it's more for manual focus, but again, if you're going to be doing big groups, that helps you, that helps control the depth of field and get everyone in the group photo in focus. Um, depth of field scale on some lengths is a great way to focus. I've got a slide to make that clear later. Oh, uh, this, is a, this is a photo that I wanted to show. Um, this is supposed to have other. Oh, <laughs> this, uh, this is a photo that I did. Um, at a, let's say, steampunk uh, carnival cabaret wedding. It was the craziest wedding. I've been shooting weddings for 33 years. Craziest wedding I've ever seen. So they had the bartenders were dressed in clockwork orange, as well as a couple of a couple of short guys. Um, not this one, but this is her, this is the wedding planner. This is her whole staff uh, and the group there in the middle. But if if the if Denise was where you were focusing the camera, everything behind her and everything in front of her would, would be in focus. So just kind of a kind of a sample of kind of what I'm talking about there. Um, white balance. I get a lot of calls from people saying, my photos look orange. I will tell you, probably your, have your camera set for daylight, and somewhere is tungsten light. Tungsten is a, uh, a regular light bulb, regular filament light bulb. It's tungsten, I mean, it's just, just what it is, it's tungsten. Uh, and it's a very kind of yellowish, orange, orange color. And if you have a camera set for daylight balance and uh, you're using tungsten, which is usually the light bulb symbol on your camera, it'll, it'll look orange. Daylight or flash or LEDs are usually uh, a little bluer and they're 5,500 degrees Kelvin. Some, some higher end cameras actually can dial in the Kelvin number on of the light. It's not important. Get close to it, no tungsten. In daylight, and fluorescent lights are very green light. So if you ever do it, if you have your photos that are fluorescent, it's not daylight balance fluorescence, and you wonder what green is to be, that's why. Uh, so this is one of those times where auto is actually good. The 
because if you have it set, if you have mixed lights like LED and tungsten, that's when you want to do auto white balance. Otherwise, avoid auto white balance. Okay? Exposure modes. And on the left hand side is what every other camera manufacturer uses. The one next to it is what Canon calls theirs. So it's a little different. Manual is full control. You set everything on your camera. You set your ISO. You set your shutter speed. You set your f-stop. You set your white balance. You set all those important things taking the photo. Um, P. Um, some people say it stands for professional. Some people say it stands for photo booth. It actually means program. Program mode will set a lot of things on your camera, but it will let you set the ISO and the white balance. Okay. Um, and that's good for constant light, by the way. Um, S, which is shutter, TV on a Canon camera, you set the shutter speed, it sets the f-stop. Not, and that's good if you want to make sure you freeze action, but you may have no depth, you may have no depth of field. Um, I think, again, that's good for action photos. AV, or uh, aperture, um, is where you set the f-stop, the shutter of the camera sets the shutter speed. And that's good for depth of field. I'm going to set it on F8. But again, you could have blurry photos depending on how much light you have falling on them. Auto, which is called, which is a green box on the Canon camera. Why? I don't know. I don't understand. But the camera sets all. So I just want something. The camera sets all, and that means constant light. So you know, so not a flash, just an LED or something. Okay, this is this is settings on a Canon camera. This is on, a, this is on my T3. Um, that's again for manual, A, B, T, D, P, or degree. These other modes are just inconsequential. They're really just ways to sell cameras. They don't, they don't really help you that much in the photo group. This is off my Nikon D90. Um, of course, it has manual, aperture, shutter priority, and auto. Which again, most cameras have those settings. The camera's just a little different. Um, and again, depending on what kind of light you're using, kind of depends on what mode you want to set it on. Uh, manual always gives you all the control. If your photos are turning out dark, and you're using constant light, if you're in manual, you can adjust the f-stop or the shutter speed to get it right. But if you're doing it all in auto and your photos are always dark, it's just it's a, it's a give and take. It may work out okay, it may not work out okay. Um, auto photo focus during manual uh, versus uh, uh, manual photos. I will tell you, Rebel cameras are good cameras. There's a huge difference between a $500 camera and a $2,000 camera when you're talking about autofocus. And if you ever have, if you, and I know this happens on most softwares because it's a driver thing, if you ever hear your, your camera go zip, 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 and you get this message on the screen saying can't take photo or can't lock focus or something like that, or your software shuts down, because the autofocus cannot lock on anything. If you have all if you have a bunch of groomsmen in your booth and you're all wearing black tuxedos, and you've got the focus point set, you know, right here, and everyone's dressed in black, there's nothing for the camera to focus on. And again, it'll go zip, 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 zip. And a lot of times shut off the software or pop up a, a, a screen or something. There's just not a lot you can do about it, except you can. <coughs> Turn off the autofocus, have someone before you get to your like before the event starts, have your assistant or someone stand in the booth, focus on them, turn off your autofocus. That way, as long as we're as long as someone stands in that area, it's going to be in focus. Now another thing you can do, and I'll show you here in a second, is if you have older lenses and they have a depth of field scale on it, you can set the you can set that. And I'll show you that in a second. So when I, uh, when I uh, set up my booth, I take two lenses with me. I take a 20 millimeter lens and a 28 millimeter lens. I do use a Nikon T90, so it is a, it is a DX. So my 20 is really a 30, my 28 is really a 32. Um, so if you'll notice here on the lens, it's got, it's got the F stops. Okay? And what that's good for is if you're using flash, and you've got a lot of exposure, like you've got like F16, you can actually set your lens. This is this is infinity. This is the infinity symbol. If I set, let's say I get 22, if I set my infinity symbol here at 22, 
everything under about a foot, a foot to infinity is going to be in focus at F22. That's a lot of depth of field. Now again, you have to have enough power, enough light to be able to do that. But this is how I light mine. I always use flash, and I always use about at least 16 or F22. Not only does it, it make sure everything's in focus, it doesn't slow down your move to focus it's much faster if you'll turn that manual focus off. However, you set your, your, your focus, if you just turn that thing off, then the focus will go faster. Now, obviously, if you're using constant light and you're you know, shooting about F4, F5.6, that's tricky, but just a suggestion. So, any questions so far? Yep. Okay, talking about lights. Every light is light. Every kind of light works. But again, there's pros and cons to those lights. You have studio strobes, and that's any kind of off camera uh, flash or strobe that's not, you know, not one of the normal slides on, LEDs, things like that. On or camera flash, you know, if it pops up on top of the camera. LEDs, like light of any diode, those are just the, the little, little the tiny bulbs that you can turn on. CFLs are compact fluorescent lights. They're the fluorescent light bulbs that look like a pink tail that kind of wound around each other. Uh, tungsten light, again, those are just regular light bulbs. And again, they're, they're, they have powerful light bulbs, but again, they're going to be tungsten that kind of orange in color. Um, positives about, or uh, some things about studio strokes, very consistent light. You know, if you get a good flash, it's going to shoot at F16 every time, F22, or whatever you set it for. Most of them have little scales on the back which you can set, one power, half power, things like that. And they're really good at freezing action. They one one thousandth of a second which are most studio strobes fire at. So again, it'll freeze a lot of action. I mean, someone can jump in the air on the vision and catch it in the air. Um, it does need a sync port. It does need some sort of connection from the camera to the flash. Um, the higher power does allow for higher f-stops. It shows me lots of depth field and non-light photos. I've kind of already talked about that. Mono lights might be larger than other lighting options. You know, so those LEDs are pretty small. The CFLs are pretty small. A mono light's going to be a little bit bigger. So it, so in a small booth, it could be an issue depending on what kind of you get. Um, nothing is no red eye. And I will tell you what causes red eye in people's eyes is when they're onboard camera flash is popping up just above the lens. And what it does is that flash comes out of the out of the, uh, the flash, bounces off the person's retina, bounces right back into the camera. That's what causes red eye. It's actually the retina being illuminated by the flash. Anytime you get the flash or light away from the from the camera lens, it'll prevent red eye. Just FYI. Um, Studio strokes part two. Um, if you ever hear someone so you go to a camera store to buy a uh, shutter of uh, uh, seats or whatever, it, it's always PC. That stands for a quantum column. That was a camera. Those were cameras in the 30s in Germany, and they just have that little connection that you know now. And then there's two different types of sync ports that are primarily used. One's called a mono, and one's called a mini mono. One's a quarter, one's an eight. These are these are samples. This is a this is a this is a, a PC sync just for, just for scale. This is the mono, and it's like a like a those are old enough you know, headphone jacks, old headphone jacks, you know, uh, or what guitars plug in things like that. So that that's a mono. Poor wrench, the mini, and it's like laser pointer for the mirrors. So this one's a, an eight So those are what mainly these some of the Chinese flashes have. Just kind of back to what we were talking about there. Um, it's got some support for screw lines, and I'll show that in a second. There's a company called Zebra, and they will custom make you scene ports, whatever link, whatever connection, whatever you want. It's kind of expensive, but I think they're well worth the investment for what I use. I'm not shooting a PC adapter. I'm going to show you a picture of one later. I use the Nikon AS15. Nikon AS15 does work with Nikon Canon. Sony, Olympus, Fuji, works with all of them because I've used it on all of them. It's about $25 to $30, but it is the best one on the market. If 
those of you that have used one before, most lower gain DSLR cameras that do not have a PC connect on it, you have to put an adapter on the hot shoe on top. You can buy $10 ones, or you can buy $30 ones. Just remember, how much do you have to pay your client back if a flash doesn't go off? Put that in perspective. Um, bad SIM cords and incorrectly connected cables are frequent causes of failure. And those SIM cords, they're like one little wire running through it. Two wires. You know, if one of those wires breaks, your, your SIM cords shot. They're only about 15 bucks. So make sure you have a couple of them on hand. Another thing is, um, uh, they're not, the cables aren't seated correctly. They're not plugged all the way into the flash. They're not plugged all the way into the uh, into the sync connector. And again, that causes the majority of flash issues. Or your flash, your uh, flash adapter is not plugged on enough, or it's not uh, on tight enough. Um, test your sync cord with a key. I'm going to show you what that means here in a second. Um, and Canon Rebels must have the live view pause in order to set off the flash, just FYI. For those of you with um, Wii software, you know there's an option there to, you know, for external flash mode. Uh, booth, you have to uh, pause uh, live view in order to do it. And that's just a driver thing. That's just the way Canon writes the drivers. Uh, this, this, uh, this, is, uh, so this is the, uh, this is a sync cord. This is a sync connector. This is a Nikon AS15. Just to let you know, this is one of my ones that I get from Zebra. I don't know if you can tell or not, this actually has a screw. This actually has a screw uh, right here and, and here. So my sync cords actually screw together, so they cannot come undone. So it's one less thing I have to worry about at my events. So just FYI, if you're having problems with your flash, if you have a sync cord, this will not shock you. I've been doing it for 30 years. You can take a key, just a car key. And if you can then, if you put your car key in that center post in your sync cord and touch against this metal, it'll set the flash off. It'll connect the circuit and set your flash off. So if you're having problems, that's one way you can tell my flash is working. As soon as I plug it into my camera, it's not. So you know the problem's not with the flash, it's with something else. Just FYI, a little, little tip on how to how to check your sync cords. Okay. On the more camera flash, kind of talked a little bit about this earlier. Pop pros, it's already on the camera, it's already there. Um, TTL gaming or you know, when you, use, when you set it on auto or program, you pop that flash up, it will read it. It may not read it accurately, but it will read it. Uh, cons, red eye, talked about that. Not very powerful in open booths. I mean, those little flash things are only about that big, you know, compared to the one this big for studio scope. So it only has you know, so much power to hit the subject, so just bear that in mind. Um, flat lighting, and it's just not a great lighting, it's, you know, if you've ever seen an all camera flash, it's kind of this funky. Um, it's bad for chroma key, if you're using a chroma key, green screen in your, in your booth, it's not the best thing for it. It can be inconsistent, um, you know, if the batteries run down, whatever, you know, if you've got to plug in the AC, it's usually not a problem. Uh, Concert lights. LEDs, CFLs, tungsten, we talked about the differences earlier. Pros, um, the light you see is how it will photograph. What you see should be what you get, not exposure quality, but you know, how it's set up. Very inexpensive. Um, it shows off the wave. You know, you've got a light, low light going on, it shows off the wave. Um, cons, you know, low lights can cause a little depth of field and blurry photos. Um, tungsten lights can be tricky. Uh, it's color balance, so just bear that in mind when constant lights. Um, Equipment. Um, this quicker than I thought it would. Um, this is what I call my text port uh, 101 on things. If you have major issues, and this is true with it doesn't matter what kind of equipment, what what you have, shut down everything, including your cameras and printers. Just an FYI, when you have a USB cable, if you have a problem, let's say you send something to the printer and it does not print, and you go, oh, I need to shut down my computer. Guess what? That signal between your computer and your printer, it may be stuck along that USB. And the only way to clear it is you have to turn off everything. Turn off your printer, turn off your camera, turn off your computer, then turn everything back on, and that should clear a 
lot of issues. So uh, just FYI, if you turn the computer off the computer, turn everything off. Have backup equipment. You know, I, I, I saw weddings for 33 years. Back in the days when I saw film, I always had two or three cameras. Now, since I have a wedding photographer, I should take six digital cameras, uh, two for the photo booth, and four that we have ready to, to shoot the wedding with. So, FYI, back up equipment, I know it's expensive, but it's less expensive than having to refund money to your client. Um, cables are your weakest link, have plenty. Those little 10 to $15 USB cables, if they go out, will shut down your event. So, you know, most stores have your, you know, the computer store, camera store, they're going to have those, those USB, make sure you buy extra SIM cables. Um, USBs will go about 15 feet. If you're trying to print far away, don't just put extensions on there. Get what's known as repeaters. There's a company in uh, Florida called PC Cables. For about 15 bucks, you can buy 15 feet worth of repeaters to push the signal up to 80 feet. Just FYI, if you have your, your printer away from your system. Um, UPS and surge protections are excellent investments. If, you're, if you go to a a, um, an old ball, you know, something from the turn of the century, they probably have bad power. If you um, are shooting something out of the doors and you're plugged into something on the outside of the building or worse, you're on the generator, make sure you have um, definitely a surge protector and have an, uh, an uninterruptible power supply. Yeah, you have uninterruptible power supply, also known as a battery backup. A $30 one won't help you like that. $100 or more battery back. They're pretty small. What they basically have is they have a battery in there that you can charge up, you plug it in, you plug your, your equipment into that battery. Should you, have a, <clears throat> should you have a power failure, it will keep everything going long enough for you to finish your grids, turn everything off, you won't damage your equipment. Computers can crash, hard drives can crash if the power goes out. Also, if any of you have ever had your die sub printer, stop while printing, it can break your printer. So again, an electrical power supply, not a bad investment on your equipment. Um, for those of you that uh, use USB, always plug your printer into the same port every time. Mark it if it can be. Um, because what happens is someone that has an Epson 3-in-1 printer at their home or home office, they usually only have one of them, so you don't really care where they're plugged into. Dice set printers are designed that you can plug in two, three, four, five. You can plug in a bunch of dice set printers into one computer. But the only way they work is it has to see each one of those printers as a completely different printer. The problem with this is that it doesn't know if you've got one printer plugged into five different ports or five different printers plugged into five different ports. If you've ever seen a copy one, copy two, copy three, copy four, it's because you've plugged it into a different port. The problem is, is most softwares, you are pointing to the printer that's plugged into a specific, a specific port. So you plug it into a different one, the software doesn't know that. So you get to your event, plug it into a different port, it doesn't print out. Again, something to bear in mind, market ports. And hubs are even worse, because if you have four, if you have four ports on your Computer, four ports on your hub. That's 16 different options. You can actually have 16 copies of your driver in devices and printers without printing. Um, when your printer is, uh, when your printer will not print, test print from the driver first. What that means is, when you go into devices and printers, and you find your, you know, your printer icon in there, if you, if you open up in the properties in the bottom right hand corner, it says print test page. If your printer you go and start your photo new software, and your printer is not printing out. Is it not printing out because of a problem with the software? Is there a problem with the driver? Is there a problem with the printer? You have three different possibilities. So if you'll just go straight into the driver, print from the driver, and if it prints from the driver, a problem somewhere else. The, your software is not seeing the driver. So again, take one thing out of the loop, you know, just to save your sanity. Um, that's a uh, five minutes. I've got one other slide here. Running a business. And I'm just going to go over this real quick. This is 
I, this is my personal opinion on things. Incorporate if you need it. My wife and I have a have an escort. We went to our lawyer and our CPA without telling each other, told them what we wanted. They both recommended an escort for us. It may not be what you need, it may be an LLC, it may want to be a sole proprietorship, whatever. But if you do want to incorporate, it does give you some legal advantages, like if you get sued, they won't take your house. Um, even the EIN, an employment identification number, government does the uh, the uh, federal government does that. Um, get a tax ID and prevent taxes if need be. Some states don't consider a photo booth taxable. Uh, you know, Texas does. I'm going to be from Texas. That's where I live. Also, in the state of Texas, if you have a tax ID, you are considered a manufacturer. We do not pay taxes on any equipment that we buy for our photo booths. Cameras, printers, we buy in state. Not be taxed over again. I can only speak for taxes, that's kind of cool for us. Get insurance, and we do not want to get sued. So, um, back to equipment, I already talked about that. Get paid in full before the gig, have a contract, have them pay a retainer. Again, this is, I can only speak for the state of Texas. When you call it a retainer and not a deposit, it changes what is refundable. So, again, talk to your lawyer, find out what the state said. Again, just a, a small bit of advice. Uh, be careful with copyright infringement. Disney loves to see the shit out of people. Be careful about using Disney characters and things like that. NFL, NCAA, anything that's, you know, that's proprietary like that. If you use it, guess what? Don't expect it not to get on the internet. You're not. You know, people will take a photo of the photos that are posted on the internet. So just be careful about that. Um, same thing for bottle releases. Again, State laws are different. Uh, in Texas, we, we really should not post anything on our website for not 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 a password protected. But on our website, we really need a lot of these. All of our contracts for our bride and grooms give us their right to use their photos, their photos. So that's why we usually post bride and grooms photo booth strips on our website because we already have the model for it. Um, the last one's business cards. Man, this is kind of a marketing thing, man. You hear someone next to you getting married. Hey, I have a booth business, I'm a DJ, or I do photography, whatever it is. I mean, that, that just helps your business. All right, so I got two more minutes, so any questions? Yes. I've got... Oh, hang on, I'm so Okay. <laughs> questions. Okay, go ahead, go ahead with your question. I've got dark room and uh, Canon. Talk real loud and hold it still. I've got dark room and a Canon and a high tie printer. Okay. And a laptop with limited uh, USB ports. Is there a hub that you would recommend that definitely works? Oh, that's an excellent question. By the way, <laughs> that's, a, that's a dark room T-shirt. Good question. Um, when it comes to hubs, I should have put that in there, buy a powered hub. If you're plugging a printer or a camera into a hub, make sure it's a powered hub. It goes to AC. They're about $30 to $40. Make sure it's a powered one. I use Belkin and, uh, I don't know what else I have. But anyway, um, get $30 to $40, make sure it's powered. Make sure it's plugged into AC. Excellent question. Okay, any other questions? 